Okay, Hosea chapter 12 and 13 tonight. Chapter 12 and chapter 13. And chapter 12, we'll, just, we'll begin in verse 9 and uh, then go through chapter 13. And I'm not going to read. I'll just read uh, 9 through 14, and then we'll read in 13 as we get there. And uh, the message uh, to Israel in this passage is basically the same that it's been, that they have rejected their God, except he throws in the phrase, your only Savior. And uh, that, uh, actually, that's a little bit different for the Old Testament because they didn't really look at God that way like we look at Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But that's the way he, he tells them that. And you'll see that in, in uh, chapter 13 and verse 4. He says, I have been your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and no Savior exists besides me. And uh, But he's also reminding them or warning them that they're fixing to go into captivity. And he uses the word destroy, and he uses the word die. He says, I will destroy you in captivity, and he's going to use the word die. And for Ephraim, he's going to tell Ephraim that, that you're dead. And so after we read this, I want to look at a couple of things in the text. And then there are several things that he says in particular in chapter 13 that have some application for you and me today in, in some of the things that he says and the way that he words them. So let's begin reading now in chapter 12 and verse 9. And he says, I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the festival days. And I will speak through the prophets and grant many visions. And I will give parables through the prophets. Since Gilead is full of evil, they will certainly come to nothing. They sacrifice bulls in Gilgal. Even their altars will be like piles of rocks on the furrows of a field. Jacob fled the territory of Aram. Israel worked to earn a wife, and he tended flocks for a wife. The Lord brought Israel from Egypt by a prophet, and Israel was tended by a prophet. Ephraim has provoked bitter anger, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and repay him for his contempt. And when you read that, in particular, verse 12, 13, and 14, you notice he goes back and forth with the names. He, he begins by, he says, Jacob fled the territory of Aram, well, we know he's talking about Jacob and Esau back in the, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob days. Uh, Jacob had to flee. Uh, but he had to flee from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him. But Rebekah used the excuse when she went and talked to um, Isaac, and she said, look, I don't want my son to take a wife of these women around here, so send him to my brother Laban. And that's the excuse that they used to get him over there. But then when he says that, then he calls him Israel, which later on he becomes Israel, but not at the time this is happening. And then he does the same thing with Ephraim. He goes back and forth with Ephraim between Israel and Ephraim. And I was wondering, and I was wondering if you wonder why he does that. Why does he go back and forth with the names? A lot of times he were, he's talking to the northern kingdom, which is Israel, but he calls them Ephraim. And then every now and then he calls them Samaria. So why, why does he use the names like that? You think it has some kind of significance? I'm, I don't know. I, I mean, I have, I have a theory, but, but I was just wondering if, if you ever thought about that or if you had any ideals as to why. So, so we look at this. We see all these different names he uses, the way that, that he portrays them through these names, like, for example, Ephraim was the largest tribe in Israel. And so when he refers to Ephraim or to Israel as Ephraim, I think he's just using Ephraim as the representative tribe. And if you look in verse uh, 1 of chapter 13, he said, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling, and he was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. So I'm thinking that probably Ephraim, as the biggest tribe, the maybe the leader tribe, they could have led Israel to God and away from idolatry. 
had they wanted to, but they didn't. The tribe of Ephraim didn't. They fell into idolatry too and led everybody else into idolatry. And he uses the word there, died, he said, and he died. And look at that spiritually. He died spiritually because we know he didn't physically because they live until the captivity. And for that matter, Ephraim is still alive today too, the tribe of Ephraim. So all of these things that he, he tells them are things that are going to happen to them right then. And that's important because when we get down into 13, a lot of the things that he's telling them are going to be future for them, a future restoration. And it's not going to be for them. It's going to be for generations in the future. And so when you drop down now to uh, verse uh, Yep, or back up to verse 11. He says, Since Gilgal was full of evil, they will certainly come to nothing. They sacrifice bulls in Gilgal. Even their altars will be like piles of rocks on the furrow. So he's making reference again now to the, to the golden calves that Jeroboam 1 set up. He set one up in Bethel, one in, in Gebir, or Gilead. And that was where they offered their sacrifices. And that's the reason he did it, so they wouldn't go back to Jerusalem because he was afraid that if they went back to Jerusalem, even once a year on the Day of Atonement, that they would realize what they had done was wrong and that they would stay there, and then he wouldn't have a kingdom. And so he set up these calves, and through the years they had worshipped there, they had offered the sacrifices, they had done all of these things there, and they had come to the point now where to them that was God. That was who they sought and who they worshipped. And he tells them that now he's going to take them, verses 12 through 14, and he's going, uh, is that it? No, back up to verse 9. He tells them that he's going to make them live again in tents as they did in the festival days, and he's going to speak through the prophets and grant many visions. So he's telling them now, he's saying, look, you're rich, you're powerful. We looked at that for the last couple of weeks that at this particular time they were. They had become very wealthy. They were very powerful. They had subjugated several lands around them, but they were also afraid right now. And the thing that they were afraid of was the Assyrians. And God had prophesied that they were going to come anyway, but the Assyrian uh, empire was starting to rise. And they were starting to take a bunch of lands and win battles. And they had already had a couple of battles with Egypt at this time. And so what Israel was doing is they were afraid. They were trying to make a deal with Assyria, but Assyria wasn't listening and so they were trying then to go to Egypt and get Egypt to come join them, and together they would fight Assyria. And God tells them, he makes reference, he says, I will make you live in tents again as in the festival days. Well, those days that he's talking about is back during the wilderness wanderings, back when they were, were doing everything God told them to do and holding the festivals. But you remember there was one festival in particular, and it was called the Feast of Tabernacles, some of the uh, translations call it the Feast of Booths. And during that seven-day period of the Feast of Tabernacles, they couldn't live in their houses. They had to go outside and collect palm brows and other things and build a tent or build a booth. And that's where they lived for those seven days. That was to remind them of the deliverance that God gave them out of Egypt because they lived in tents all those years wandering in the wilderness. But not only did they live in tents, they were totally dependent on God during those days. In the wilderness, they didn't... We were talking about this the other night. Uh, I don't remember where we'd been, but we were talking about, you know, well, you, don't, you didn't just run to town back in those days. And... In Douglas, you, there wasn't any stores. The only stores up there, they sold, you know, Cokes and cigarettes and maybe Vienna sausage, and that was all they sold. And that's the way they were in the desert. They, didn't, they couldn't just run to Walmart or run to the next town and get what they needed because there weren't any. 
They were totally dependent upon God. And so he tells them, what I'm going to do to you is I'm going to send you into captivity and it's going to be like those days. You refuse to worship me. You refuse to walk in my ways. So I'm going to put you in a position where you'll have to be totally dependent upon me. And this ought to remind you of something. It ought to bring the tribulation to your mind, the seven-year tribulation period, because that's what God is going to do during the seven-year tribulation period. He's going to bring Israel to a place where they have to call upon God. They have to, to have their Messiah or they will be completely destroyed. And when you go back in history and follow their patterns, every time they went into captivity, after a period of time, what did they do? They started calling on God. They would repent. They would begin to seek the ways of the Lord, look for prophets, look for people like Daniel in the Babylonian captivity, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah to lead them back to God. And most of the time when they cried out to God, as with the uh, um, prodigal son, when they came to their senses and they began to call out to God, God would deliver them. And he gives them the example there in 12 through 14 of Jacob and then of also of themselves in the wilderness. And the example there is, is both of those, both of them, Jacob and then Israel in the wilderness, they were in places that they didn't necessarily want to be. They were in circumstances that they were bad. They didn't want to be there. But the, the point is, is that God was with them the whole time. And he brought them back to the promised land. And in both cases, he brought them back better off than they were before when they left. For example, the children of Israel. The scripture tells us that when they left Egypt, as when, Egypt when Pharaoh finally said, look, get out of here, go. When they left, the, uh, Exodus chapter 3 uses the term plunder. They plundered the Egyptians. And God told Moses, he said, look, he said, when I lead you out, when I bring, deliver the people, he says, tell them to go to all the Egyptians around them and ask them for clothes, ask them for gold, for silver and all these things. And he says, they're going to give them to them and you load your wagons and you come out. And that's what happened. And again, they used the word plunder. In Psalm 105, he says it like this, beginning in verse 37. He says, Then he brought Israel out with silver and gold, and no one among the tribes stumbled. The Egyptians were glad when they left, for the dread of Israel had fallen on them. So they went in there, fairly wealthy, 70 people, Isaac and or Jacob and, and all the boys, and and while they were there, they became a nation. And the book of Exodus also tells us that when they came out, there were 650,000 fighting men. And so when you consider their wives, their children, the others that would have been associated, that's where we arrive at the number of, there were probably two to two and a half million of them that came out of Egypt. And not only had they become a great nation, but they were rich. God had provided for them. And everything they needed, he had done. And so that's what he's telling them here. And the example with Jacob. Jacob had to flee. When he went to, uh, to Haran, he didn't have a thing. All he had was his staff, and that was it. But when he left, even though Laban had tried to lie to him, trick him, steal everything he had, when he left, he was rich. He had herds. He had flocks. He had money, he had man's, you know, servants, all kinds of servants. He had already, well, already Joseph was born, so that would have been 10 kids. So God blessed them. And that's the point that God's trying to make to them. Look, you're not listening to me, and so I'm going to have to chastise you. I'm going to have to discipline you, and I'm going to send you into captivity. The word he uses again for Ephraim is you're going to die spiritually you're gonna be suffering like never before but he said remember that every time that you have found yourself as the nation israel in a bad spot i was there and i took care of you 
and I'm going to do it again. Now you're thinking, well, if God is, is always going to do that, every time that something happens, every time that they rebel, and he has to send them into captivity, but he's going to watch over them and he's going to bring them out, what's the purpose of doing it in the first place? You ever thought about that? Because the way that we think most of the time is, I'm going to go ahead and do this because, yeah, God's going to discipline me, but he's going to bring me out and he's going to bless me. So, so why do it in the first place? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you here in just a minute. And the reason is something that's going to apply to you and me today. So God gives them this blessing. God gives them this promise and they just kept turning to idols. And that's what verse 14 says. He says, even in spite of all of this that he's told them, verse 14, Ephraim has provoked bitter anger from the Lord. So the Lord will leave his blood guilt on him. He's going to, in other words, Ephraim's going to die in his sin. Rather than repent, rather than turn back, he's going to die in his sin in captivity. So in 13.1, again, he calls him that the, he, Ephraim was, was exalted in Israel. He could have led the people to the truth, but he didn't. And then in verse 2, this is interesting. He says, of chapter 13, he says, Now they continue to sin and make themselves a cast image, the calves, idols skillfully made from their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. And the people say about them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Now, think about that for a minute while I turn the air conditioner back on. Are you okay now? I'm just right now. Okay, well, it's pretty hot in here. So they're making these images, these calves, and they're, they're crying out, let's kiss the calves. Kiss the calves. Does that remind you of anything? Psalm chapter 2. In Psalm chapter 2, that's the passage where the Lord, through David, is prophesying. And he says, you know, why do the heathen rage and why do the nations imagine such a vain thing? They say, let us cast off the bonds of the Lord and, and his anointed one and, and let us get away from them. And then the Lord begins to... Uh, chastise them he begins to come back at them and he says look you idiots he says the lord sits on his throne in heaven and he laughs and he has all the nations in derision he tells them that they need to repent and you remember what he tells them he says you need to kiss the son lest his anger flare up at you in an instant so it's kind of compared to or, or maybe set in opposition to they're kissing these calves they're, they're trying to worship these calves and and honor them as gods and he's telling them look what you need to be doing is you need to be kissing the son s-o-n son you need to be kissing the anointed one honoring him bringing worship to him paying homage to him because he is the one that can save you but again as he goes back through, they didn't listen. He says, therefore, they will be like the morning mist, like the early dew that vanishes, like chafe blown through a threshing, threshing floor, or like smoke from a window. And we looked at that. He's already used that analogy once against them. And it reminds us of the book of James, where James says, our life is but a vapor. We don't know what's going to happen, and we don't know how long it's going to be. Well, he's telling them, you're the same way. You're just a mist. You come along, you, you want to worship me and have all my blessings, but you want all these idols too. And he says it doesn't work that way. And as a result, they're going to go into captivity. Now drop down to verse 13 of chapter 13. Verse 13. Or back up to verse 12. He says, Ephraim's guilt is preserved his sin is stored up. Again, he's going to die in his sin. And then he says, verse 13, labor pains come on him. He is not a wise son, and when the time comes, he will not be born. And then he says, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. Death, where are your barbs? Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. So there are two things in these two verses that, that really ought to strike a chord with us. 
First of all, he tells them, he says, labor pains have come upon him, but he is not a wise son, and when the time comes, he will not be born. So what's he talking about? Labor pains, he's talking about, is all of these, what we would call minor judgments, have come upon them. All of these things that, that God has done to get their attention, to let them know that that judgment is coming, and you need to stop now and repent. Turn back to Amos, or, or turn forward to Amos. And chapter 4, and I, I want to remind you of something that we looked at when, when we were in Amos, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. This is what God's talking about when he says, the birth pains have come upon you. Listen to what he says. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all your cities a shortage of food in all your communities, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I also withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I sent rain on one city, but no rain on another. One field received rain while a field with no rain withered. Two or three cities staggered to another city to drink water, but were not satisfied, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I struck you with blight and mildew, and locusts devoured your many gardens and vineyards and your fig trees and olive trees, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I sent plagues like those of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I caused the stench of your camp to fill your nostrils, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a burning stick snatched from a fire, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. So those are the birth pains. Yes, that's God's judgment, but again, it's like a, a minor judgment. It's something that God is doing, and he's trying to get their attention before the final judgment comes. And just as in the case with Amos, so it was with Hosea, they didn't see it. They didn't understand that all of these things that are happening were birth pains, were warnings from God. Now back in Amos chapter 4, in verse 12, then he says this, and we talked about this extensively when we study in Amos. He says, therefore Israel, this is what I will do to you, and since I will do that to you Israel, Prepare to meet your God. Judgment is coming. The same thing. Hosea says it, but he just says it in a little bit different way. And he tells them the labor pains have come, but he says when it's time for the birth, you're not going to be able to deliver. You're not going to be able to bring forth because, he said, you keep turning to idols. What are they doing? They're kissing the calves rather than repenting and turning to the Lord. Now those labor pains that God is describing in our day could be compared to what he describes in Matthew chapter 24 as labor pains or birth pains. Remember in Matthew chapter 24 beginning in verse 4 after the disciples have asked him Lord what will be the sign of these things and when will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age he gives them what we call the birth pains because Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 says these are the beginning of birth pains and he talks about earthquakes, he talks about uh, famines, plagues, he talks about false prophets, he talks about false Christ and he says many people will be deceived in that famous line wars and rumors of wars and nations against nations all of these things are birth pains and the Lord says that when you see all of these things happen, you need to get ready because the day of the Lord is coming. That time of judgment is coming. And today, I'm afraid we see the same thing in not only in the church, but in the world that Amos and Hosea saw. We see all of these things that God tells us is going to happen, all of these birth pains, and yet it seems like we... We just say, oh, well, you know, that's just something else. It seems like 
that we take the attitude that I just mentioned to you about with Israel. If every time God is going to pronounce judgment on them, but he's also going to give them the promise of future restoration, then why get excited about judgment? Why worry about what's fixing to happen? Because future restoration is coming. And maybe we think the same way. Maybe we don't get excited about what God is showing us is fixing to happen because, well, we've got the promise of heaven anyway. We've got the promise of the rap. We're going to get raptured out before it, the day of the Lord hits anyway. So why should we be concerned about it? Well, the reason we should be concerned about it is the same reason that they should have been concerned about it. They could have avoided a lot of stuff had they repented and turned to the Lord. They could have saved a lot of lives. They could have saved their nation if they had turned to the Lord, but they didn't. And so the birth pangs for you and me are the same thing. It's a warning letting us know that judgment is about to come. Now, in our case, there's a major difference when the day of judgment starts, and that is, is that the day of grace, the church age, ends at the rapture. Then we go into the tribulation period. Now, people during the tribulation will still be saved. They will still be saved by faith, just like we are, but that time that the Lord is talking about and is prophesied is over. And we also know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that people that have heard the truth, that had opportunity to be saved and rejected that, God will send them a strong delusion so they will believe the lie. Romans chapter 1 uses the phrase, he gave them over. He gave them up to their sin and to their darkened mind. So for you and me, we see these birth pains. Well, hey, it's not a big deal for me. I'm going to get caught up in the rapture. I'm going to be in heaven while all that's happening. Yeah, but there are people all around us that aren't going to be. And like these Israelites, they're going to wind up in that day of judgment. And if they aren't saved and they've had that opportunity when they get there, Paul says that God's going to send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. And that's just like what he told Ephraim back in verse 1. He said, and Ephraim, you're going to die. You've had all of these opportunities, all of these birth pains. You've got all of this history of everything that I've done with Jacob and how I delivered all of your people out of, out of Egypt and yet you're still turning a blind eye to me. You're still rejecting me. So what did he say? You're going to die. You're going to go into captivity, and you're going to die. But in verse 14, he does give them again the promise. And this is a promise that we're all familiar with because it's one of our favorites. And he says, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol, or power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And then he goes into that phrase that Paul picked up on, death, where are your barbs? Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from mine eyes. Now you say, well, that ain't what Paul said. Well, that's because Paul quoted the Septuagint, and our Old Testament is, quote, is taken out of the Hebrew. And when Paul made this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 55, where he said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Or vice versa. I think I got it backward, actually. He was quoting the Septuagint. So when they translated the, the Hebrew into Greek, that's, what, that's how they translated it. What the Hebrew actually says is what we read here in verse 14. And he says, Death, where is your barb? Shell, where is your sting? Sheol, where is your sting? So he gives them this promise a future restoration. He gives them this promise that death will have no power over them. Now, remember that because in just a minute, that's going to be very important as what we talked about just a while ago. What does he mean about compassion is hidden from my eyes? The King James says repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. And this is God talking. He said, look, compassion is going to be hid from me. 
or, or repentance w will be hidden from mine eyes. What does he mean about that? What he's telling them is he's not going to change his mind. Once they get to this point, I'm not going to change my mind. The judgment's coming. Now, the good part about that is, is that means that the promise that he gives them in verse 14, he's not going to change his mind either. Just like they're going to go into captivity, they're going to die in captivity, the promise of future restoration and resurrection is sure too. So at this point, they're going to die, but they know that at some point future, they will be raised again as a nation, and in particular in the last days, but for now, judgment is coming. The ideal here, and the way that Paul quotes it also, is that God will be to death what death is to us. God is saying to Sheol, to death, he's saying, look, man, where are your barbs? You, you, I've defamed you. I've taken your sting. I've taken the fear that you hold away. And so he is going to be to death what death is to us. And the greatest fear that we have in our lives is what? Death. That's what all of us fear. Every time something happens, you know, every time the doctor calls or, you know, or, or whatever, that's what we think. That's what we fear is death. And so God is going to put the fear of death into death. And he did it on the cross when Jesus died for our sins and then the third day later he, he rose again from the dead. And you remember the phrase that he's given in, in, that he gives us in the book of Revelation. He says, I am the first and the last. I am he that was dead and I'm alive again and I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So no longer does, does death, Satan, have that over us because we now know that we have eternal life. Hebrews chapter 2. Turn over there or, or mark it. Write it down so you can go to it. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. And this tells us that the fear of death should not be a fear for you and me anymore. It should not be a controlling factor in our lives. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through death, through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. So Jesus took that fear of death and he conquered it. And he did it by his own resurrection. And so now we, as his children, should not be afraid of death. I, I know I've shared this with you before a couple of times, but it, it, it's still one of my favorite movies. And I can't get over this particular line in the movie Risen. And Peter, and after Jesus has, has resurrected and he's met with all the disciples and he's sent them out, well, the Romans have caught uh, Peter. And they're holding him there, you know, and they got the sword to his throat. And they're saying, look, if you don't tell us what we want to know, we can kill you. And Peter looks at him and he says, we're not afraid of that anymore. And, and I thought to myself, amen. That's what salvation does for us. That's what being born again and regenerated by the Holy Spirit does for us. It takes away that fear of death because now we have eternal life we know that when this life is over that we will live forever in heaven with jesus christ so verse 14 is a promise of the resurrection you and me we look forward to the resurrection on the day of the rapture now in verses 14 through 16 i want you to see a pattern he says i will ransom them from the power of shield i will redeem them from death he says, death, where are your barbs? Shell, where is your shield? Where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from mine eyes. Verse 15, although he flourishes among his brothers, talking about Ephraim again, an east wind will come, a wind from the Lord rising from the desert. His water source will fail and his spring will run dry. The wind will plunder the treasury of every precious item. 
Verse 16, Samaria will bear her guilt because she has rebelled against the Lord. Now listen to what he says here. They will fall by the sword, their children will be dashed to pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. So he's telling them when the Assyrians come, when that final judgment, that day of the Lord comes, this is what's going to happen. Now again, I ask you, does that ring a bell? That, that should remind you of some things that are said elsewhere in Scripture. This is a pattern that God used of judgment that's going to come upon them. What Hosea is prophesying to them happened during the Assyrians' invasion. When the Assyrians came in, that's what they did. They ransacked the city. They, there's records in, in Josephus and a couple of other ancient writings where that's a, they, they killed the children. They would take them by the feet and just dash them up against a, a wall. They killed everybody except the ones that they took as slaves. It happened again, not so much in the Babylonian captivity, because once the Babylonians pretty much took the surrounding area, Israel, even though they, they ransacked the city and destroyed the temple, Israel kind of, or Judah, kind of went along with them. But then if you'll flip over to Zechariah, and we're going to do that in just a minute. In Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah describes judgment that's going to come upon them in the last days almost identical to what Hosea says. And he talks about the city being ransacked. In, in, in Zechariah, uh, two-thirds of the people are going to be killed. And he uses the language about the children and about the women again. Okay, that happened in 70 A.D. Under the Roman, when the Romans destroyed Israel. And folks, it's going to happen again under the Antichrist. When the Antichrist gathers up all the armies of the earth and comes against Israel. It's a pattern of judgment that God shows them. And it should be to you and me a warning. Be ready. Be prepared. Now, back to what I've been pointing to or hinting at all evening. All of these warnings, all of these threats of judgment, and then right behind it, a promise of resurrection, a promise of restoration, a promise that the, the nation will rise again and, and, and see the glory that God had promised them. Here's the deal. Let's just use Hosea's day right now and, and the people that Hosea is prophesying to. Those promises of restoration, of resurrection, of restoration, those promises did those people no good. Why? They died in captivity. The only good that they did them was that they knew that their nation, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, would not be destroyed and, and blotted out from the face of this, the earth. The promises did them no good because they had rejected their salvation and the other phrase I've been using all through this with Ephraim, they died in their sin. Now, these promises would be fulfilled in a future generation. And we see that in our study that we did in Ezra and Nehemiah. After the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity kind of melted into the Babylonian captivity. And then God brought them back. God delivered them, brought them back. The nation was restored. The city was rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt. They began to worship God again. But then over a period of time, what happened? The same thing. And then we wind up. After this, Jesus came. Jesus was born. He lived among them for 33 years. Their Messiah. And what did they do? They rejected him. He wasn't what they were expecting. He wasn't what they wanted. And so what happened? Rome came in the exact same 
pattern of judgment. Not only did Rome destroy the city and, and, and kill millions of Jews in A.D. 70, but Rome took those that were still alive out of the land and dispersed them all across the, the, the world. Until when? 1948. 1948. So again, in A.D. 70, all of those promises did them no good. And the reason that it did them no good is because they rejected what God had offered them, the grace that God had offered them. So, 1948, God begins to bring the people back. Israel becomes a nation again. They're restored. All of the promises are being fulfilled. The nation is, to quote Isaiah, is blooming like a, a flower in the desert. Everything that God said is happening. But again, the pattern is going to happen again. Persecution's going to start. It's already started on them. Look at, look at where they're at right now, today. The, the, the battles they're having on seven fronts. They're fighting seven different enemies right now. Basically the same enemy, just in seven different areas. It's all going to happen again. All of this that we see right now, it's like the birth pains. And it's leading up to the tribulation period. And in the tribulation period, the exact same pattern of judgment is going to happen. At the end of the tribulation, Antichrist is going to gather up all the nations of the world. Joel chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 12, chapter 14, Revelation chapter 19 and 20. All the nations of the world are going to come against Jerusalem and for a little while, it's going to look like that all is lost. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Again, the prophecy is, is that two-thirds of the people will be slaughtered during that time. Only the remnant will survive. The difference in these patterns is, is that in the tribulation, and now if you want to go to Zechariah, we will, because I love this verse. The difference is in Zechariah chapter 14. I want to read verses 1 through 4. Look, a day belonging to the Lord is coming when the plunder taken from you will be delivered in your presence, be divided in your presence. So they're going to be ransacked. They're going to be taken just like the others, and they're going to divide all of the riches that they have Right there in their presence, and there'll be nothing they can do about it. Joel says that too. He says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured. The houses looted. The women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. Now, here's the difference. Verse 3. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. In verse 4, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The difference is, is that in the tribulation, when this pattern of judgment starts again, the difference is, is that's going to signal the coming of the Messiah, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, then they will call upon Jesus. Now, they could call upon Jesus right now. They know the truth. There's enough evangelists over there. There's enough people that, that's working in, in Israel and among the Jews, sharing the gospel with them. They know, but they won't call upon Jesus. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm convinced two-thirds of them are going to die during this time. But the remnant will live. And at that time, they will see the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will recognize him as their Messiah. And that's back in chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they have pierced. They're going to receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and that's going to break that pattern of judgment. And listen, what's going to happen at this time is the new covenant. 
that he's promised to them. And what's going to break that pattern is, is that when they receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah, the Holy Spirit's going to come into them. And verse 10 of chapter 12, then I will pour out on them a spirit, the spirit, the Holy Spirit upon them, and they will be born again. And watch what he says now in Ezekiel chapter 36, and then I'll, I'll close. Ezekiel chapter 36. And he's prophesying about that day. Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 20. The Lord speaking through Ezekiel to these heathen, rebellious Israelites. And he says, when they came to the nations where they went in captivity, being dispersed, he said, they profaned my holy name because it was said about them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they had to leave his land in exile. Then I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you went. And I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name that you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. This is the declaration of the Lord God when I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Now beginning in verse 25, he says, I will also sprinkle clean, and notice another thing I always point out to you in these teachings, notice the I wills. Nowhere in here are you gonna find where he says you've got to or you need to. I will, verse 25, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your iniquities and all your idols. Verse 26, the new covenant, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Born again. And then here's the kicker, verse 28. And you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors. What was the problem with the old covenant? It was weak through the flesh. We couldn't keep the law. No matter how hard we tried, it couldn't be done. That's why Hebrew says he did away with the old covenant. He brought in the new. That's why Paul says in the book of Colossians that he took the law and he nailed it to the cross because it was a curse upon the people. And that's why the new covenant came in. Why did the Jews continually get taken out of the land? Because the law was a covenant between God and and the nation Israel for possession of the land. But at the second coming with the new covenant, what does he say? You will live in the land that I gave your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. It will be theirs for all eternity because of the new covenant that God made with them. So all of these people in Hosea's day, they died in their sin. All of this was written for future generations on whom the days of the end will come. And the point that I wanted to make tonight is that's just like Matthew chapter 24. I'm in, in a running discussion right now with a gentleman and he keeps going back to Matthew 24 and he says, see, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to go through that and, and those who endure to the end will be saved. And I keep telling him, brother, you're taking all of that out of context. That's all written for us to learn from, but who's it written for? It's written for the Jews that will be alive during the tribulation period. None of those things.
will fall upon us because we will have been raptured out of here. Just like with them, they see all of these things that God written, but it was for who? Another generation. We get in on the new covenant. We're born again. We're saved. But all of those things are written for those on whom the days will fall. Amen. I hope that makes sense. I get excited sometimes and don't get it all out there just right. Any questions? Any comments? All right. Don, you, I, had, I thought about it a week or two ago. You're talking about they put the golden calves in Beth, Bethel. Bethel, Bethel and, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, there's another place where I, I, I remember people going back to Bethel, mm -hmm. you know, that's like a, as, okay. like, as a, a, a repentance, is that two different Yeah, that places? was with, with Jacob, okay. back in the days of Jacob, when he came, when he came through, he stopped at Bethel, and uh, that, there was a well there, and he had an experience with God, and so when he went over to Laban, over there, back to Bethel, that means he's back home, he's back where he's supposed to be, so. I like that you was, you remember. <laughs>